Year 20 at uh, St. James uh, United Methodist Church, I'm, I'm in my 27th year here now. In year 20, I thought I was done. I, I thought I was finished. I thought I had done all I could do, that there was nothing else I could. Well, actually, I didn't think that. I thought there was a lot more I could do, but God kind of gave me this idea that maybe I had this control issue that I wouldn't go anywhere else, that I refused to go anywhere else, that I was part of an itinerant ministry, which my district superintendent was wont to remind me every stinking year, you know, we move. We're United Methodists. We move. And all of my friends have moved four or five times in the same period of time since I came to St. James. So I was like, fine, I'll give up control. I will put myself on the moving list, which gave the same district superintendent who told me it was an itinerant ministry a heart attack. I walked into his office in you know January for our annual meeting where he says, well, what are you thinking? Is the congregation clearly wants you back? Do you want to stay? And I was like, nope, it's time for me to go. <laughs> He had walked around the table with nothing in his hand, nothing to write anything down, no preparation whatsoever, assuming I was his easy meeting of the day, and I was not his easy meeting of the day. So he said, oh my gosh. <laughs> he turns back around, and in a flustered way, you know, he goes over and he gets his notepad, and he comes back around, and he sits in the chair next to me, and he says, what gifts do you have? <laughs> it's like... Apparently, longevity. That's uh, pretty much what I got going, you know. Uh, uh, other than that, I don't know. So we talked for a while, and as it turns out, the cabinet discerned, he discerned, the other district superintendents, the bishop discerned it was time to send me back. And I felt that was a confirmation. Now, the funny thing was, he called me on the last day of the cabinet meeting, and he said, James, there's nowhere we can send you. You're just going to have to go back to St. James. Great. Now, of course, another district superintendent calls me later that afternoon. He says, James, we prayed a lot, and we discerned that you were supposed to go back. Now, that's the kind of thing you want to hear. We discerned you want to go back. Not, we can't find any place for you, James. There is no other square hole that we can stick that round peg in, uh, you know, that hard. So, the, the interesting thing about that is I treasured my control so much, and the only way I could truly serve God was to give that control up, was to say, okay, God, if you want me to put on the moving list, because that's what I discerned in my prayer, you want me to be on the moving list, I will go on the moving list. I'm not comfortable with this. <laughs> I don't like this, but I'll put myself on the list. Fine. And then I came back anyway. So, I mean, the funny thing is that the thing that we treasure often becomes, uh, reveals a lot about who we really are. The thing that becomes the treasure in our lives shapes who we really are, reveals who we really are, what it is we treasure in life. Now, I suspect that, you know, you saw, if you, read the, uh, if you read the email blast of the week, or if you saw the, uh, uh, you read what the message was about, or told you last week it was about treasure, that you thought to yourself, he's going to say something about money. Yes, give a lot of it to the church. That's important. We want you to. There you go. I've said it. It's out of the way. You know, it's no hi hidden thing behind the table. I've said it. Now we're going to stop talking about it. We're going to move on to the scripture lesson because I want to, to focus on what I think God wants us to focus on today. Stop collecting. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 6 beginning uh, with verse 19. Stop collecting treasures for your own benefit on earth where moth and rust eat them and where thieves break in and steal them. Instead, collect treasures for yourself in heaven, where moth and rust don't eat them, and where thieves don't break in and steal them. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is a lamp of the body. Therefore, if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how terrible that darkness will be. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be loyal to the one 
and have contempt for the other, you cannot serve God and wealth. So, that was in year 20. We're in year 27 at St. James. Uh, and one of the things I have to tell you is the hardest part about the way I preach. Uh, you, you see me do it every week, or relatively close to every week. One of the hardest parts of this is I sit down with the text on Monday, and I begin to ask, what does this say to me? And how does it apply to anybody else, perhaps? What can I learn from it? And it usually requires me to go to step four in a 12-step program, which is to do a fearless moral inventory of myself, both my strengths and my weaknesses. And I want to tell you that as much as I'd like to tell you that I've moved beyond treasure, I have no treasures that stand between me and God, I would be lying to you and there would be lightning through the roof right now and Bill has already told me we're not paying to replace the roof if I uh, say things like this in, in worship that calls lightning down. So I'm going to try to behave myself and tell you that it, this sermon is hard because if figuring out what you treasure reveals who you really are, then you have to ask yourself, well, what is it that I really treasure? What is it that... I would lay my life down for. Now, I live in a society, it's a consumer-driven society, that lays its life down every day to earn enough money to get the stuff that they think is important. And I guess they includes us. I, you know, it's real easy to point out there. All those people out there, they lay down their lives to earn the stuff so that they can have stuff, stuff, stuff. Because in a consumer-driven society, I was told that it was my patriotic duty, actually, to buy stuff because it would support the economy and give you all jobs. And if I stop buying stuff, you'll be jobless. <laughs> so I, I buy stuff. Believe me, I'm keeping, you, I'm keeping you employed. Don't worry. I am making sure because i got plenty of treasure. And I store it up in my house that's really your house. And someday I'm going to have to move out of that house. And I don't know what's going to happen. Got junk is going to have to come to our house is really what's going to happen. Got junk? A lot of it. A lot of it. And I'm worried about that junk, so I have really good locks on my front door because I don't want anyone to break in and steal. This is totally true. Did you hear the words that Jesus said to those folks? Don't store up stuff here because guess what? When you store it up here, you spend all of your time trying to protect that instead of remembering that your life is meant to be given away. You don't have time to give it away because you're busy protecting the stuff that you keep putting in your house. I go to the store. I get some more stuff. I don't even have to go to the store anymore. I pop open my computer. And when I pop open my computer, I can just uh, get that Amazon, you know, people. And if it's not Amazon, it's somebody else. I can, man, I can get Google Express to bring me stuff right away, immediately. Uh, they'll deliver me food today, right now. If I want a pizza, I can call up and get it right now. I don't even have to leave this building. I can get stuff. In fact, I don't even have to have a full-size computer. My little tiny computer over there called an iPhone, I can order up stuff right here, right here, and it can come to me. I can just accumulate stuff, 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 stuff. Now, the challenge is some of you have gotten past the whole stuff accumulation thing, but you still have issues. You treasure your control. You treasure affection of other people. And you treasure your security. You want to be secure. Do you know, I, I, okay, I'll just admit it. The United Methodist Church is going through growing pains, breaking up pains. Breaking up's hard to do. I don't know. In February of next year, big meeting, United Methodists from around the world going to decide if we stay together, break apart, what it looks like. It's, you know, who knows. I, I, don't, I don't want you to be afraid. Don't be afraid, because we'll still be St. James. I just don't know if we'll be St. James United Methodist. St. James used to be United Methodist. I don't know what we'll be. We'll be St. James. That's all I know we'll be. You know, I, I you know, used to be United, now broken up United, you know, broken up Methodist. I, I don't know. And I, I, I make light of it. Uh, but it's a, it weighs heavily. And it weighed heavily on a lot of my clergy friends. All right, if I'm really honest, it weighed a little bit on me. Because the big question was not what's going to happen to the church, but what's going to happen to my pension? 
what's going to happen to my pension? I've got a big pile of money somewhere that the United Methodist Church is, is it, am I going to get it? Well, guess what? The United Methodist Church did something to try to make my little security concerns go away. They broke off the pension, you know, from the United Methodist. It's not even called United Methodist Pensions and Benefits anymore. It is called West Path. I don't know what that means, except that even if we're broken up United Methodists or broken up Methodists or whatever we are, I will still have a pension. Great. Because my security is not in God. It's in a pile of money somewhere in the stock market, which could crash at any moment, and I would have no money, and it would be sad, and blah, blah, blah. Where is our security? Jesus asked us to ask that question. I sat with this for the entire week. You only have to listen to me for like 20 minutes. <laughs> for a week I sat, okay, what really is my treasure? Oh, God is my treasure. You know how I know? Because I sit with God every morning. I sit with God every morning and I treasure those 13 seconds. You know that I sit with God. They are wonderful. And then I go out and do my rest. I, it's not like that at all. You know, since I started the living school, actually, I do four hours of sitting with God every day. What else does he do? do are we paying him to sit and sit with God for four hours a day? Yep, you are. <laughs> and I am enjoying it, baby. I'm raking that stuff in. goes right in my checking account. I'm just writing checks on. The truth is, what do I really treasure? And the question you need to ask yourself is, what do you really treasure? What do you really treasure? What, sh what shapes your life? Is it success? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to be successful? And by whose standards are those successes? You know, by society's standards of success, by your neighbor's standards of success, by your own standards of success. God has been humiliating me all week long because I sit in centering prayer and I cannot center. Now, I don't know whether I'm humiliating myself, God's humiliating myself, but it's been humiliating because I'm supposed to be professional at this. You know, I've been doing this for five years. I sit in centering prayer now, not just once a day, twice a day. I sit for 25 minutes of absolute silence with God, only it's not absolutely silent. I am solving the world's problems in here. And guess what? In centering prayer, there are a lot, but the problem is in centering prayer, I'm supposed to let go and let God. I'm just supposed to let go and have space with God. And I have failed, and it's been humiliating. And this morning, I laughed at myself even. In the middle of centering prayer at 5, roughly 14 in the morning, Linda's still upstairs asleep, and I'm sitting in my chair, and I'm laughing. I'm not laughing very loud because I don't want to wake Linda up, and I don't want Reedy to get all, you know, spassy. But uh, I'm laughing because I realized the humiliation was a good thing. I've been asking God for humiliation. It even came into my email box. Father Richard said this week, he didn't say it this week, he said it in a book I read years ago. He said, you know what, I pray for a good humiliation every day because it reveals my shadow self and my idealized persona. And it, and it reveals them for what they are, fake. I imagined after five years I would be successful at centering prayer and I could move on to something else. <laughs> And it hasn't happened. <laughs> it hasn't happened. I'm just not sure I'm ever going to be successful at it. But you know what? God loves me in failure. And maybe that's the lesson God has for me. But you see, I treasure success. I treasure success. I treasure competence. I want you to think every week when I get up here that I'm really competent to be talking to you. Inside, I want you to think, that boy knows something. That boy knows something, and I'm going to hear what he has to say. I, I want to be competent. I, I got over one piece of the challenge of being uh, a clergy person. For a long time, I wanted you to like me. I'm over it. You know, uh, you already do, and if you don't, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of other churches that may or may not be united somewhere around the world, you know, uh, soon enough. Um, and, and eventually the DS will say, listen, everybody left. I think they stopped liking you. you we're going to have to send you to another church now for you to kill. Um, <laughs> um, the truth is I got over that. You know, one, it, there are three core needs that supposedly spiritual needs that we all have, and they are uh, the need for control, the need for security, the need for affection. 
and, uh, and they're not really needs. They're desires. They're wants. I want people to like me. I, I'd like it. But I don't care if you like me anymore. And I mean that in the best possible way. I hope you'll take that in a person. I once said to Linda, it was the wrong thing to say. I said, I said to Linda, honey, I finally reached a point in my life where, you know, if you left me, it would be okay. <laughs> I could stand on my own two feet. It would be all right. I'm my own person. I want you to know that if you're thinking of leaving, it's all right. <laughs> I meant it in the best possible way. I wanted her to know I was finally reached secure, a secure place. That I loved her with my whole heart, but that my life didn't depend on her. That my life depended on God. That's what I was trying to say. Next time, if you want to say that to someone that's significant in your life, say, my whole life now depends on God. I hope nothing ever happens to you, but if it does, and if you leave me or whatever, I'll be okay. I just want you to know that. I don't think, I don't, don't even say anything. Just, just know it in your heart. Just know it in your heart because that crossed the line. That was years ago. And look, we're still married. <laughs> yeah, I am pretty lucky. I do grovel every day for somewhere between 20 and 50 minutes. But once I'm finished, we're still married. I'm kidding. I'm really mostly kidding. And... Uh, <laughs> I am always, when, when I do a fearless inventory of my life, first of all, I don't know if there's such thing as a fearless inventory. Because I approach an inventory of my life with fear and trepidation. What is it that I really treasure? What is it that I spend my life pursuing? What is it that I'm doing with my life? And does it really matter? Is this what God wants me to pursue? This is the question you have to ask. This is the treasure question. This is the treasure question that begins on verse 19 of chapter 6 and actually goes through the whole rest of the chapter. What are you worried about? You see, the answer to the question that, I, that, that we've been asking is sort of in the section that comes right after it, verses 25 through 34, if you happen to look in your Bible. You know, worry about what's really important to worry about. Why are you concerned about the unimportant things? Why are you concerned about whether everybody likes you? Because I've got bad news for you. Everybody is not going to like you. No matter how hard you try, no matter how nice you are, someone's not going to like you. That person's just too nice. I can't stand them. Can you stand it? They are just like saccharine sweet. They are like Pollyanna. Have you ever seen the movie Pollyanna? That is my favorite movie of all time, almost, except for... Well, I like to say anything, and I guess Princess Bride. So it's way up there, and she is sweet, and she plays the glad game. Everything is good and pretty, and that, you know, but some people can't take that. So there will always be someone, no matter how good you bend over backwards. And then you have to ask yourself, if you treasure that so much, where are you? What happened to you? What it reveals about you is there is no you. There's only what everybody else thinks you should be. And you know what? That's a real waste of you. Because God only made one of you. I say this, all, you know why I have to say this every week? Because I think you forget. And you know why I think you forget? Because I forget. <laughs> I will have forgotten by 15 minutes after worship that God only made one of me. Some of you are saying, thank God. <laughs> there is only one of you in all of eternity. That's you. That's you. To live and be the person God wants you to be. Stop worrying about what everybody thinks and about your own security and about control. Because it's imagined. If you, can, if you think you're even in control of your own emotions sometimes, it's your imagination. Let's just admit it. Let's own it. It's imagination. We don't have control over much in our lives. We live and receive this moment as the gift that it is from God. Is this a downer sermon? Is this kind of a downer? Are you feeling down? No. Because if it is, tough. So, uh, toughen up. <laughs> yeah. If I were going to say what's most important here, there's a lot of room for grace in this. 
there's a lot of room for grace. If you do a fearless inventory, that's your assignment for the week, by the way, do a fearless inventory of your life, both your strengths and your weaknesses, a fearless inventory of what your treasure is, that is your assignment. If you do it and you find out that you're treasuring things that you think are temporal, that are pointless, God still loves you right where you are. Right now, no matter what your top treasure is in life, God loves you right now. Remember that. And there's grace for you to grow and change. Part of the reason why it's step four in the 12 steps is because most of us spend a lifetime lying to ourselves about what our treasure is. We say our treasure is God. But then we live like our treasure is money. Or we live like our treasure is success. Or we live like our treasure is friendship. Or acclaim. Or fortune. Or fame. Or warmth. Or whatever it happens to be. We live like our treasure is what it really, really is. Part of what Jesus is just trying to do in the Sermon on the Mount from beginning to end is wake us up to who we really already are. To know that we're loved right where that is, but that there's more to us. There's more to us than what we even imagine. See, God sees you for who you are. God made you to to tune that one song, to tune that one note that you're meant to play. And your life is about revealing God's glory through that one note that you are meant to play. And you get to spend a lifetime, however long that is, figuring out what that note is and then learning to play it really, really well. And God gives you a lot of latitude to discover it and then to live it. Can you be the note that God wants you to play? Probably not for as long as your treasure is something other than God. I will tell you, no matter how much money you have in your bank account, there will never be enough. It will never fill the hole that you feel. No matter how much success you have, no matter how many homes you own, no matter how many people pat you on the back and tell you how great you are, if that is your sense of treasure, if that's what you live for, your question will always be, that was so 15 minutes ago, what have you done for me lately? Have you noticed that's kind of become our attitude? What have you done for me lately in society? What have you done for me lately? Yeah, you patted me on the back 15 minutes ago, but this is 15 minutes later. Where's my pat on the back now? But if your treasure truly is God, and your life is oriented around God, then suddenly there's space for love. There's space for more stuff in your house because you're getting rid of stuff that you don't need. You're traveling light because you realize what's most important in life is the relationships you're going to make with people that you meet. Even if it's for 15 minutes in the store in line like Marge does, no matter where she goes, that woman makes relationships with people I don't even know, and she'll never see them again maybe. Do you see how important treasure is in your life? and having the right thing to treasure, because it really does reveal who you are, and it guides how you shape your life. So, I told you what your assignment is already, but I'll tell it to you one more time. Step four in the 12 steps is doing a fearless inventory of yourself. And when you're doing that fearless inventory, I ask that you do a fearless inventory that specifically asks, what is it that I treasure? What do I build my life around? What are the clues? If you can't figure it out right off the top of your head, look at the clues. Where do you spend all your time? Where do you spend all your money? Where, where do you spend all your energy? What is the thing that tweaks you when it goes wrong? Oh my gosh, the stock market went down 3%. You know, 3%. <laughs> Suddenly my... The retirement account's only worth $15 instead of $18. Whatever. You know, what is it that tweaks you? Because that's where your treasure is. And see, God's untweakable. God's not going anywhere. That stuff is. God isn't. 
fearless inventory next week. I expect you to bring it in, and we will all stand up and tell everyone what's wrong. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Megan had a very serious look on her face like, oh, my gosh, no. <laughs> no, not really. I'm the only one that stands up and does, you know, crack headed things like that. So uh, um, do it. You might be surprised by what you discover and how much grace and room there is for you to grow. Isn't that a wonderful promise? How much grace and room there is for you to grow. What you love reveals who you are.